are probably a good amount of people watching this thinking, Woof, Jack's really taking it easy this week. Duke Nukem Forever, I mean, come on, that game's so awful the video practically writes itself. My AI-generated scripts aside, I want you to know that writing this video was a walk through hell for your 18th favorite YouTuber, as I not only had to play Dookie Nuki's Big Kablooey, but find a way to summarize the history of the most bungled game development of all time. Luckily, this anti-ankle bracelet is keeping me at my desk and will help me stay focused. If you really want an abridged version of Duke Nukem Forever's development, just imagine what it would be like if a clown who looked about 50% qualified for his job was juggling several small infants, all while bragging how good he was at tossing toddlers. For a more in-depth look at what exactly made this happen, and trust me, it will all make sense when we get there, Duke's story starts in 1987 as the brainchild of Todd Repelogue, Scott Miller, and George Broussard. I've got three dads. Problem. Let's rock. Forget what you know about Duke as a character as when he started out he was the tried and tested character trope of some guy hired by the CIA to defeat Dr. Proton. The game itself, originally titled Future Metal, slowly morphed into a Duke vehicle as the team in Apogee fell in love with the character. Or more honestly, his name. It's a really fun name to say over and over again. So the game was released as a standard run-and-gun platformer. Nothing special about it in all honesty. It was the sort of game that you look at and say, Ah yes, video game. I know this one. You collect points and win at the end. All checks out. Carry on. It sold around 65,000 copies, which for what was an indie game at the time was good, but the most you honestly have to talk about with this game is how they nearly got crib killed by Captain Outrageous. If you gave someone 100 years and say draw a connection between these two, I bet most people would fail. But the character of Duke Nuke Um in Captain Planet already took the genius name and left Apogee with a real brain tickler. We love the name, but if Ted finds out we've been using it, he'll come to our houses and recycle us into bones and viscera. Scott, get George in here! With a quick change in vowels, they were back in the races in 1993 with the release of Duke Nukem 2. Here, they'd finally decided to put some character behind those sunglasses and made him a take on all those action movie cliches. They got his costume down pat and had him going up against an alien threat with aspirations of domination. And they'd use Duke's brain as the blueprint for their plans. It's a pretty straightforward upgrade over the original game, another what you see is what you get. But for the next game, what they would see would be unlike anything they had ever seen before. Series Shepherds were sent off to the new Apogee Division when the company had the idea to create divisions for specific game genres. 3D Realms was made, and from there they came into ownership of the Build Engine, a brand new shooter engine created by Ken Silverman, the author of Ken's Labyrinth. The engine, which was made by one guy, had some major advantages over the popular Doom engine. For starters, it had a higher level of interactivity, more capacity for background details, and a more efficient way to script out sequences for the player. It would be put to good use in 1996 when Duke Nukem 3D was released. Boomer shooters finally had their Bart Simpson. Duke Nukem 3D was a big moment for 3D shooters, where Doom had innovated, Duke had improved. Not as much in gameplay, that's all up to preference, but in terms of character, in terms of flash, in terms of spectacle. Listen, I love Doom Guy. I have a Funko Pop of the guy, for God's sakes. You don't see me getting a Betty Crocker Funko, but most of his personality comes from either single frames of artwork or from our imaginations. Duke is bursting with charm, humor, and, uh, boobs, but who's to say that played any part in his success? Voiced by the irreplaceable John St. John, um, did you know that he also played the Sunk of the Hog Hog character Bug the Cug? Yes, of course you do, everybody mentions it. Duke was filled with one-liners and context-sensitive zingers that ingratiated him to the gaming public. Now, some have called him out for never speaking a sentence not first said by Bruce Campbell or Rowdy Roddy Piper, which is, I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. <sighs> And I'm all out of bubble. Hail to the king, baby. Fair, but I feel like that reputation comes a little more from the future and not the now. As for the now, Duke was on top. Five episodes of Duke 3D and a wave of the pop icon fixins like action figures, posters, a theme song by Megadeth, Duke was riding high. The fine folks at 3D Realms decided to capitalize and announced Duke's next outing, Duke Nukem Forever. Not only is it the most ironic title in all of gaming ever, it also banked on the fact that Batman Forever would be relevant until the end of time. 
The sequel was announced in 1997 and would run on the Quake engine, with it being nice enough to start licensing it out to other developers who wanted a piece of their incredibly brown cake. However, before the game had ever even been officially announced to the public, 3D Realms started a troubling pattern of behavior when it came to that engine. They just never knew when to stop. By the end of the year, before the game had ever been shown off, the engine changed, since Quake 2 was coming out with an even spiffier engine, id Tech 2. 3D Realms couldn't stand the idea of their game not being the top of the line, and as such pivoted from an engine that they didn't know to an engine nobody knew. But what do I know? George Broussard is the one who actually knows anything, and he's leading development on this game. And it seems like it would all be smooth sailing from here on out. Games go through pre-production troubles all the time, and by the end of 1997, going into mid-1998, things were going groovy. Screenshots in gaming magazines, presentations at E3, Duke was all ready for his big debut at the end of the- they changed engines again? Okay, folks, slight delay, so it turns out now that id Tech 2 wasn't good enough as Duke leapt onto the Unreal Engine. Now an engine switch from id Tech 1 to 2 is... Well, it's awful because nobody even had an idea how to use id Tech 1, let alone 2, but there was probably some stuff that could still be ported over from one engine to the next. They were made by the same company, after all. However, id Tech 2 to Unreal was far worse, putting the team back to square one. This is all down to that head honcho, George Broussard. He's a passionate guy, but I don't think it's unfair to also say he's an easily distracted one. Like a kid in a candy store, George chose to keep cramming in newer and newer things into Duke and attempt to make it the hottest game on the market. Without fast shooters advanced, you can imagine that caused a lot of problems. So the game is going through another quick retooling. It's fine, this sort of stuff happens all the time in games. They're complex beasts and have a lot of moving parts you need to get just right. And it's not like they gave up on the game. I mean, look, there's some screenshots from a magazine. All right, looking good. I don't suppose the gaming equivalent of cannibalism is nigh or anything. <sighs> okay, strap in, because the story of how Duke ended up at Take-Two Games is friggin' wacky. So, 3D Realms joins the massive developer SuperClick known as the Gathering of Developers, most famous for, and I mean this, the guy game. Hey, don't I know you from somewhere? Come on, bro, I made the child porn game. Ah! Oh. Soon Take Two saw value in this and bought up the gathering developers and cherry picked what they wanted from their catalogs. One such cherry was Duke Nukem, its license and the publishing responsibilities for forever. They had a pretty big stake in Duke's success and moreover actually seeing the game be released. This went against George Broussard's vision of Duke Nukem as a sort of weird train set in your basement that you focus on instead of your failing marriage. 2000 was bereft of Duke news, clearly to make way for uh, the big dog, until E3 when the infamous Duke Nukem Forever trailer dropped. My god, they were making a game all along and it was good looking! It was like a game with... Uh, buttons and controls and all that jazz and it was actually gonna come out except well there was a small problem the game looked good but uh, did it look serious sam good did it look wolfenstein good uh, did it look half-life or halo good uh, sadly the answer was Eh, kinda, which didn't sit well with anybody, least of all Broussard. In Half-Life alone, there were buckets upon buckets of improvements that all but changed shooters as we play them. I replaced boobs with physics puzzles and Duke's motor mouth with a mouth sewn shut, and you had Half-Life! Duke only had so much time left to come out before he was left in the dust, and with any luck, two years of infoless dead air aren't coming anytime soon. 2003 had kicked its way in, Brock Lesnar had broken his neck in the WrestleMania main event, and Duke Nukem Forever still wasn't out. And people were starting to get antsy. Development cycles like this were a lot rarer back in these times, and without the minute-to-minute -minute updates on a game that were afforded today, and most people had assumed that the game had kicked the bucket. Would it have been smarter to put Duke six feet under and just work on something else to kick the funk of this beyond cursed dev cycle? Uh, who's to say? George is to say, because after the president of Take-Two said the game was still in development and that they were dedicating five million dollars to cover the game's failures to materialize, Broussard said to his boss, Take-Two needs to shut the f*** up. We don't want Take-Two saying stupid things in public for the sole reason of helping their stock. It's our time and money that we're spending on the game, so either we're absolutely stupid and clueless, or we believe in what we're making. George, baby, nobody would have said you were stupid and clueless if you didn't put it in their heads first. George was chatting bold about the passion that he and his team had for this game. His team of 18 people, thanks to the fact that they had been so shell-shocked by the length of Duke Nukem Forever's development, they had just stopped hiring new people. Are those staff, by the way? 
Most of them were fresh out of school cherubs brought on not due to any particular want for new blood in the studio, but because they would work for under the industry standard wage. What were they supposed to do? Go find another job? Ah, oh, good luck with that when your resume just says Duke Nukem Forever 1997 to I don't know, and that was the exact release date. Complete smoke. Whenever Take Two would try to set a release date, George Broussard would shoot it down, repeating over and over again, it'll be out when it's out, it'll be out when it's out. Even when tempted with a half million dollar bonus for getting the game out by the end of 2006, you know, after nine years in development, George yet again denied them, saying the game would never ship before it was finished. Let that sink in. That and there would be no concrete release date. In what was a perfect recreation of Marie Antoinette telling the peasants to eat cake, 3D Realms staff had had enough. See, 3D Realms went about paying its staff in a very silly and very stupid way. Most jobs just pay you at the end of the week. Uh, you know, paychecks? Well, the ones coming out of George's pockets were exceptionally light. That was thanks to the fact the employees' pay didn't mainly come from the week-to-week -week work. Instead, they'd share the profits of the product once they released it. And with the 10-year anniversary candles on the Duke Nukem Forever development cake blown out and George proclaiming the game wasn't coming out anytime soon, they'd had enough, and 3D Realms was gutted of its development team. The first cold splash of water to George's system in a long, long time, they had hired a new team with their dwindling funds from the 3D days and got to work. December 2007 marked the first time in six years Duke decided to show his big dumb mug in this town, and it was... well, it was all pre-rendered and showed no real gameplay. This was back in the day where that was a thing that we complained about and not a practice that had beaten us all into submission. Remember, soldiers, no game, no hype. Those is the rules. Despite what a fully CG trailer implies, the game was actually being duct taped back together by the strongest developer of all time, I guess, Brian Hook. What made him so powerful was that if George Broussard came to him with a bad idea that would ruin everything, instead of doing it, he would tell George, no, that's a bad idea that would ruin everything, and that worked. However, those endless Duke 3D funds finally found their end, and six million dollars were needed to finish the game. Six million dollars in the hands of Take Two. The same hand that George Broussard had taken a piss in all those years ago with a constant moving of release dates and calls for the publisher to quote, shut the fuck up. So, how did the meetings go? You come to me, a master treated like a dog, and expect me to give you tribute for failure upon failure. Yeah, yeah, sure, here you go. From there, the U.S. justice system gets involved, so it's all gonna get a lot less complicated. 3D Realms alleged that Take-Two tried lowballing them on their agreed six million. Take-Two alleged that George sucks eggs. This raged for another two years until both sides dismissed the suit. Uh, like two kids punching each other in the head at recess, and neither really cared why they were fighting, and once the bell rang, they just went back inside and had juice boxes because no one was paying attention anymore. Soon, a splinter cell within 3D Realms, Triptic Games had decided to join together and rent out office space in the same building as Gearbox Software. It was in that grotty hole that the Triptych Boys, as they were called by me, found the man who would agree to fund the rest of Duke's development, the man who would ultimately save the game, and a first ballot pick for the top 10 most sexually deviant magicians in all of history, Randy Pitchford. Oh, the time in the day I'd need to talk about Dirty Randy's bizarre escapades, uh, from trying and failing to kick the piss out of Claptrap's voice actor, uh, to botching the reveal of Borderlands 3 so bad he had to try a last ditch attempt magic act to save the show, spoilers, didn't work, to the- How is it twice? How is it twice in the same video from different sources? But what's more important than that is how we saved Duke Nukem! Gearbox bought the rights to the Duke IP and from there finished the game, with it coming out that the version worked on by Brian Hook was all that was left because the 2001 version was thrown out into a big dumpster. By the grace of God, a mere one year later and the game was finally out, and everybody lived happily ever after. Oh no! Well, at least all the developers and publishers are done fighting and I can move on to talking about- Another lawsuit? Two! Whatever, it's too much legal drama for this and we unbelievably actually have to talk about the game now. I see some judging eyes out there saying, Jack, were you just covering the history of the game to avoid having to talk about it for as long as possible? Oh no, 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 I was just uh, uh, look at the dancing baby! 
So after a quick logo screen showing it really takes a village to make a duke, we get to see the last thing they did for the game. As you can see, there is no budget on the screen. This is one of the cheapest looking openings I've ever seen. It's just keyframes of Duke running and doing random things. Uh, shoot a pig, censor the video, meet the local submarine. There are moments where you can see Duke pop into existence. There's putting your best foot forward and there's rolling your ankle the first chance you get. So after starting a new game, it feels like the intro is about to start all over again when we get our first bit of gameplay from the most infamous game ever made. You know the guy who pre-ordered this game back in 2001? Yeah, the guy who got this massive care package from 3D Realms after holding on to his pre-order for a whole decade? The biggest Duke Nukem fan in the world, probably? Wonder what he thought when he saw this. I wasn't gonna let Duke tackle the big city with a full bladder and spend painstaking time just paying. Regardless of if he's wearing gloves, Duke's not getting out of here with dirty hands and I take him to the sink. They did a good job keeping the interactivity of the maps in this new version. I'd say just short of Duke's one-liners, it was 3D's biggest claim to fame. You can spray some soap on your hands, wash them, dry them off, take a shower, all in the first room. Well, if the game could keep up this sort of quality, I'd say we're in the green, boys. After getting done making Tinkle, we find that the Earth Defense Forces are planning a counterattack against invading aliens, and we have to draft up a battle plan. Brother, say no more. I can't lie and say I didn't spend a lot of time just drawing this out, and you can guess I tried to stay in character. The first rule of modern warfare is to be yourself and have fun. I go over to give my friends a big pep talk before going out there. Nothing in the world is gonna stop me from giving it my all, except I do need to hydrate. I mean, come on, what if I got dry mouth? All right, time to take on the ale. Ah, never mind, I surrender, I'll just go home now. Hey pal, what are you gonna do? Save the world all by yourself? No, you're right, I was just getting out of your hair, buddy. My brave retreat was interrupted as I get a devastator and have to throw down with a cycloid emperor. No real point to comment on the controls, really. It's a shooter, they don't use IJKL to control the game. You have to try to mess up that badly. This fight is mostly just really boring, since the Devastator does barely any damage and the boss never even threatens to hit you, so you're just walking around looking for ammo, shooting, then looking for more ammo. I did find out that you can zoom in with your aim, which has no practical application except humana humana arg! So we kill the Emperor and punt his eye for a field goal. It's then that we realize that Duke Nukem Forever was actually just a game set within Duke Nukem Forever. Wrap your heads around that. We zoom out to see Duke playing it when these two girls rise up, uh, presumably after helping Duke tie his shoes. These are the Wholesome Twins, currently fighting with the game's title for who can be more outdated. The actual plot of the game is that 12 years have passed since Duke 3D and the aliens are back, except Duke has expressed orders to not fight them since they're not hostile. As a setup, it's not the worst thing ever, it's at least different from 3D throwing you right in the action, but was it the right thing to do for Duke specifically? I mean, the intro itself was, well, not action-packed, more like action adjacent, but this intro is really slow for Duke. It at least gives us a chance to look around Duke's penthouse and introduce us to the ecosystem. By going around the environment and interacting with stuff, you can up Duke's total health. It's a cute idea since the game doesn't really have any secrets like the old game has, uh, giving people incentive to check out the environments and see all the details they packed in. The ecosystem, though, is its own can of worms. Duke betrays the boomer shooter court and has been caught consorting with the dark arts of regenerating health instead of health packs. See, Duke's got his ego bar, which comes back over time. I'm not gonna say which is better, health packs or regenerating health. Health packs can be annoying if you run out and are left on death's door, and regenerating health can trivialize all difficulty as you just sit there and wait for your health to come back. We can all agree that Ultra Kill does it the best. Back to the game, and after failing at pool so badly in front of the girls that I run away pissing myself, I run into Statue of Naked Lady! We also get to see what Duke's been up to, uh, going to Universal to pose with Jaws, paying someone to take him to the top of Mount Everest, and playing with that fake sport UFC. Once I get to the bottom floor, the girls scare me with flash photography and I run away to the real game, eating candy and drinking soda. This is gameplay. We get word that the aliens have finally come down from their mothership to try our fast food as Guys, why is there blood on the walls? Before we go out for the interview we're scheduled to do, I try to get some food, but there's this weird noise I can't seem to- Eek! Eek! A mouse! A mouse! A sweet little tyke comes up to us and asks us for our autograph. Aw, oh, sure thing, sport. Let me just write something out real quick to you, and there! Finally time to go out. All right, Duke, all right. Just imagine the audience is in their underwear. We trained for this. Go get him, champ! Looks like they're shutting us down for the night.
On slow days, all I hear is Johnny, 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 but a couple of those aliens come down and suddenly it's all news, all channels. Half the damned crew is left to see what they're up to at Duke Burger. Gotta wonder if they timed it with you coming on the show and all. Nobody wants to see me anymore? Well, I didn't want to see them anyway. Whatever. On our way back to the penthouse, the aliens restart their attack and lock us in an elevator. We got a 69! Whoa, sorry guys, I... That was almost too funny, I got scared. We go through the Duke Nukem Museum and get to our throne, which takes us to the Duke Cave. There we have a conference call with the General and the President saying we can't fight back against the alien because then who's the real homicidal baby-eating psychopaths then, hmm? This order is followed for all of a single room as the aliens are already attacking us. Access denied. Red key card required. Key card? I don't need no f***ing key card. Ah, Duke, back at it again with the observations. If there's one thing Duke Nukem isn't, it's out of date. We catch some aliens preening in my weightlifting room and take them out before getting a few more ego points of lifting weights, playing pinball, and tossing the old basketball, which takes just, just so long to actually land. The game may get throwing objects pretty wrong, but remember how good the water in the sink looked. Eventually, we get the beer power-up, which makes Duke Nukem take less damage at the cost of making him f***ing legless. This thing better be Vanta Black and taste like drain cleaner if it's able to turn Duke into a drunken fool after a single can. We also figure out Duke Vision, and it's honestly a little terrifying that they had the need to tie the night vision to a command since that means we're gonna be getting a lot of use out of it. I stealthily sneak past two aliens, cause once this is all over I'm hoping to make friends with at least some of them and eventually slink my way to a barrel which lets me throw them like mother and this is now my fighting style, I only want to do this. We eventually get to Duke's private reactor and have to go grab batteries to charge it up again. Remember before when Duke was making fun of the game for daring to ask him to get a key card? Well, Duke's just doing exactly that now. The last one is locked in a room with no entrances or exits that thankfully has an RC car in it for some gameplay diversity. Gold star, Duke! Next time, make it fun, too! Final battery grabbed as we finally get the lights back on and head out to the alien menace. We down a whole bottle of steroids and send aliens flying like Goofy. Duke keeps making references during gameplay that I'm sure somebody with a mortgage would find unbearably funny, uh, but most of them just fly over my head. They're either references to movies nobody has seen or Homestar runner fan fictions I can't tell. We get Duke's golden handgun and learn that the game has a two weapon limit. I have the alien standard gun and this worthless pea shooter to defend myself with. What is in Duke's pockets that he doesn't have the space to spare for more than one weapon at a time? What's weird is that in the options you can actually up it to four weapons. Why is this a setting? I'm really in a two weapon mood today. Four seems a little uh, greedy, don't you think? So we hop into the turret and- Congratulations! For a decade of waiting for this game, we're gifting you your very own turret section! I can imagine someone who's been alive for less time than Duke Nukem Forever has been in development getting to this part and just feeling hollow. This is the definition of a mindless turret sequence. The mothership never really aims at you. The challenge is in shooting these little gunships who drop off troopers to shoot you, but once they're dead, you just sit still and shoot the ship until it dies. You're in no danger until gunships start firing the laser beams on top of you. It's teeth grindingly boring, and as a part of what's supposed to be the action packed opening, is so underwhelming. Now, Duke, if you keep doing things like that with your fingers, they're gonna be stuck that way. Duke passes out for four hours after a small knock to the noggin, and when we wake up, we have to go all the way back through the air vents to come out on the top of a falling elevator, where you're just doing stationary turret sequences. It's the same overheat bar as the turrets pulling the emergency brakes. This can't be fun to anybody. What is the point of putting it here? It feels like padding for a game that's only gone on for two minutes. So as soon as we get out, we- Oh, that's gonna be the gimmick, is it? We're tiny now, like in the sections of Duke 3D. Except where those were just tinier parts of a larger level, this is the level. Being so small makes these relatively small environments feel needlessly big. And it's not like Duke can get around quickly. Dashing for two seconds puts Dukes in the throes of a minor full body shutdown. So we get those precious physics puzzles and- What the hell? I know right where I'd stick him. Mm, I want to stick that human man up my entire vagina. So the kid who may or may not be the same one who I signed the book for earlier, I can't recognize him if he's not holding it, offers to let me use his RC car to get around. <laughs> Later, suckers! 
Hey suckers, I kinda need some help with the car. It'd be really weird if this game had fantastic driving controls, so luckily the theme is kept up as the driving sucks. Nothing about it feels right, it turns really tight, gets caught on everything, and has that godforsaken temperature bar on it. Did George owe a temperature bar a favor or something? Aliens keep abducting all the babes, which you can't really do anything about since you're the size of a G.I. Joe. It's also really easy to fall off the tracks, although the game is kind enough to not force you to restart. Duke just activates his teleportation belt and manages to get back into position. It turns out these aliens are immune to baby bullets out of a tiny gun and we just have to run past them. Duke, making you run away from the enemies was something I was doing as a joke! More driving and we make it to the casino floor. Here we get first person platforming. Oh, game, game, what did I do to you? Okay, so I wrote about your decade and a half of failure. That's not my fault. These bar stools bounce you in weird ways where no matter what you do, you'll always end up in the same spot, which makes the whole section feel more like a formality the game wants done just as badly as I do. We get back to the wholesome twins and a particle expander to get us back to full size. I could carry you around in my pocket like a little pet. <laughs> Your hot pocket. <laughs> Why does every woman want to stick me up their cooter? We get out the shotgun and now have to ward off teleporting aliens. This shotgun is pretty reliable, but it's one of those guns that if you aren't standing directly in front of the enemy, misses entirely. After fending off aliens, the wholesomes go to make out and... And I really hope they're not twins, are they? Oh, oh god, it's getting freaky. Hey, wait! So with his main squeezes stolen, Duke finally acts like there's an alien invasion going on and gets his rear into gear. Not my babes. Not in my town. You alien motherfuckers are gonna pay for this. I will say this game does do one thing really well. It gives John St. John a lot of room to explore the Duke voice. He doesn't always speak in the same low, gruff register and actually does get to add a lot of emotion to certain lines. The game then has an amazing idea of letting you run all the way back through the level you just carted through except as a big boy. The game doesn't go for those old school run and gun levels where the pace is all about your ability. Instead, it just plops you down into battle arenas that go on for just a little too long without introducing anything remotely new or fun. We climb up a Duke statue to some soldiers and get instantly killed by this pig cop in two shots. I think when I was really broken was in this room with this ramp. If this were a game with anything interesting in it, then you would find a fun trinket or something behind there, but no, there's just sadness. After that is a room where we have to get past trip mines by either sneaking past them or blowing them up with a gun. Later on, you get to play with fire as shooting fire extinguishers lets you put them out. These definitely needed to be in the game. Nothing time wasted around these parts, I reckon. After that is a hilarious exchange between these two soldiers. Oh, this game is a side splitter, I tell ya. Now we can cause some damage. You don't say cause some damage around Duke Nukem, man. You say we're gonna go bust some balls or tear shit up or something like that. Oh, um, right, uh, let's rupture some spleens together. Why are you such a douche? After that is this big helicopter son of a gun who comes in and almost instantly kills me. Nuts. Oh, look, it restarts us back with these two and they're gonna say this every time. Oh, I really hate how Duke Vision is bound to F. I keep meaning to throw a bomb when instead I get really concerned about my shades. I wonder if these two ever kiss. Did you know this guy is voiced by Christopher Savitt? Yeah, the same voice as Vegeta. I thought that was funny. This guy is a massive damage sponge. It is agony to fight him. You sit there, on your hands, soaking up bullets and returning them in kind. There's no strategy. There's no fun. It's just busy work. This game is some sick Zack and Cody simulator. When am I gonna leave this godforsaken casino? General Graves, the General Graves, tells us all the crap we already know about the aliens taking our women and tells us to meet up with Captain Dylan. The game is annoying most of the time, don't get me wrong, but Dylan and his whole section are where it gets un- Bearable. Duke, good to fucking see ya. I knew that retirement bullshit was just bullshit. Fuck that retirement shit. I just got back from helping my friend find his wife. Christ, what a fucking pussy. Graves wants me to help you jack these motherfuckers up just like old fucking times. Can't wait to pound them in the cornhole. Hoo ah! The bandana and talking about his friend's wife are clearly all Gears of War references, but instead of the other Duke games where the most the references get is a wink and a nudge, I eh, think the doomed space marine from 3D, this one follows you everywhere you go. He's not funny or endearing like the old humor, he's just grating for how he never shuts up and spends most of the time replacing any humor with curse words. Duke, we've got your green power armor over here and ready to go. Power armor is for p***s. Um... Well, okay, uh, 
You want a gun instead? Okay, Duke, baby, I know we did this back in 3D, but that was back when you and Doom weren't even playing field. It doesn't really work when the game surrounding it sucks. Not just that, but you're taking from Halo as we speak. That regenerating health didn't come out of nowhere. Duke Nukem Forever tries to have its cake and eat it too, making fun of modern games while picking their bones for ideas, and it just doesn't work. When the game is as witless and charmless as this one is, one-liners like this just come off as embarrassing, just swinging wildly at competitors way out of your league. Our old buddy the turret section is back and better than ever, and after that is another snore of a level. We're stuck on a highway running from post to post with Dylan screaming in our ear. We've got a Leroy Jenkins joke, and do you understand how dire these straights are when that is the most relevant joke in the game? And whenever you clear a section in this game, it plays the same guitar string every time, and it's not a big enough deal to complain about, but I'm in a sour mood. So we get dropped into another arena, with the promise of this one being that if we complete it, we get a sewer level! Guys, my birthday is until September! After clearing out the last of the grunts, a battle lord hits the scene for a boss fight. Boss enemies in this game are special in how they're only vulnerable to explosive weapons like bombs or rockets. In theory, this makes sense, since it's not like bullets are going to do much to this guy short of tickling him. But you can't carry nearly as many explosives as you can bullets. So you just have to run around this pillar to ammo crates to fuel up, shoot, run back, shoot over and over again till he's about to die, then you get butt blasted at the last possible second and have to do the whole thing over again. Game, I don't have to do this game. I can go back to play more licensed Disney games. The people like that for some reason. So we rip off the horn and jam it in his eye before training on his speed back and winning. It's finally time for our precious sewer level. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if this uh, sewer grate crushed me? I can't even be mad about this. I brought this on myself. So we eventually do make it into the top. It was funny the first time! Dylan's behind the door and you can imagine I took a break to listen to what he had to say. So Duke slinks around the sewers and destroyed roads and sections that are almost too fun for words. I'm not wasting Snake Eater on you, game. So we have to wait a good long while for the game to catch up to itself. It's really feeling itself here. These guys up on top of the crane are having a conversation, which I think was meant to be comedy. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say George Broussard's kid modeled this part. Why else would we still be here? So after hearing those lovable additions to the Dukeverse talk for what feels like forever, they all die and we get to move on to a turret section with no turret. The platform moves for us and we just have to shoot. We're not conserving ammo, we're not being tested, we're certainly not having fun. It's just a waiting game. You can probably beat some Duke 3D levels in the time this section takes. Not level, levels. Even contemporary games of the time like Call of Duty knew not to just leave the player sitting in place for minutes on end doing nothing interesting. After we're mercifully let off, though, we have to go through a small area with a railgun. It's a strong energy weapon that, with a clean headshot, can't even beat the most basic grunt in the game. Sometimes. After that is another section where instead of getting up and at him, taking the fight to the monsters, Duke is rendered too weak to leave this small house. You die so quickly that leaving it is a one-way ticket to death. After that is perhaps the game's death certificate. It shows plain as day that it has no idea what makes a Duke Nukem game a Duke Nukem game. A physics puzzle. I don't think I can really impart how awful this specific segment is. Without any prompting, the game just wants you to know that you have to throw blue barrels into the back of this shipping crate. It's the only time the game ever wants you to do something like this. Never before and never again. Who on God's green earth wanted this in a Duke Nukem game? I still haven't even gotten to go anywhere remotely interesting. I spent the first hour inside a casino and the next one in boring brown environments. Where's the bright Vegas lights, the colorful city streets and buildings? interiors. Where is any amount of personality? After this is a relatively quick section where we're controlling a wrecking ball before we have to go into the hive. <sighs> Fuck me. So, look, I'm really worried about this. I'm speaking genuinely. The hive is one of the most disgusting sections in any game I ever played. I normally don't do this, but... Viewer discretion is advised. The aliens have converted the Duke Dome into a breeding ground where they've trapped women and are impregnating them to grow new aliens. That means that the soundtrack to this part of the game is the sounds of women moaning in pain, uh, screaming in agony, and begging Duke to kill them. What is this? Oh yeah, Duke's a classic sort of action hero character. The game's tongue-in-cheek and goofy. Don't take it so seriously, narc. But also, here's this segment that's just... <laughs> so friggin' grim. This isn't Predator, this isn't Last Action Hero, this isn't even Aliens, this is just grotty and horrible. You can't save the girls like you can in Duke 64. Literally, all you can do is shoot them to save them from being tortured. Why? 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 Why any of this? I want to say something more intelligent about all this, but it's... 
I'm just so confused. Who, who asked for this? Who pitched this? Why did anybody want to play through this? And why is Duke still cracking jokes? This is a big topic of discussion in the Duke Nukem community. How this character, it's just not Duke Nukem. This is Dick Kickum. Duke is a vain, brick-headed macho man who will write a book about how great he is, but he also saves people and lays down his life to protect the Earth because it's the right thing to do. Dick Kickham is a completely philanderized version of what Duke was. If Duke was pretty vain, Dick can't bear not looking at himself for five seconds. If Duke makes one-liners, Dick recites entire movies word for word. If Duke is a character of the macho 80s action hero, Dick is what people assume an 80s action hero is after watching a season 27 episode of The Simpsons on it. It's not just Duke, though. Everybody in this game is so unbearable to talk to or listen to because they all act the same way Duke does. They're all constantly cracking jokes and being jerks because the writers wrongly amplify Duke's worst traits to the point of annoyance and then painted everybody with the same strokes. This whole game just feels so sleazy and gross and it's amplified to 100 in this part. But Jack, you may say, Duke Nukem Forever is a perfect portrayal of the character. It's the exact same as he was before. We just grew up of it. That's a nice opinion. Did a YouTuber give it to you? I'm not saying Duke wasn't a jerk in the old games. I'm saying you don't remember Duke 3D that well. Don't lie. Most of the people either parroting this opinion or proposing it in the first place are either getting Duke's characterization extremely wrong due to the gap in time between 3D's release and the start of this discussion, or have never played it to begin with. And that's the major problem, really. The gap in time. That decade and a half of development where no major Duke games were released was just time where everybody's perception of Duke warped further and further to the point that they just boiled it down to, named Duke, yellow hair, generally kind of a jerk, movie reference. And while that's not exactly too far off from where Duke was originally, it was all about shedding those layers of subtlety and good writing that brought us to Dick Kickham. And before you even posit it, no, turning Duke into a washed up has-been is not the answer. Just because Duke is mostly a power fantasy doesn't mean that we have to see the other side of the coin of him being vulnerable. You can do that with Kratos, as there was always the side of a character that was an emotionally destroyed father consumed by self-loathing. You can't really do that with Duke. The most turning Duke into a loser would serve as a takedown of the very idea of Duke, and I don't know anybody who would actually want to see that, but would also buy the game. That argument goes further out the window when you realize there's a perfectly crafted modern Duke Nukem game that gets his character perfectly right, makes him charming, funny, even relatable. Bulletstorm! For the game's remaster, they added the Duke Tour mode, where they literally just swapped the main character for Duke Nukem, keeping all the dialogue the exact same except for Duke, who is woefully lost as to what's going on. Duke's one-liners actually land, he has human characters to bounce off and deliver his lines to, while also knowing when to stop and treat the plot seriously. So, uh, you wanna make out? Just two hardened dudes sitting in an elevator snuggling out their woes in a totally hetero way? Huh. There's a nervous chuckle. Either your human side gets the joke or your computer side likes the way my ass looks in these jeans. Or a little of both, perhaps. Hey, I'm not judging. I'm just looking good. So what was the point of this tangent? Duke doesn't need to change. He was fine the way he was in 3D and forever should not be used as the building block for forming any opinion on Duke. Cause this game ping pongs in tone from the horrible mutilated screams of women to Duke and the twins making bad jokes to Duke swearing revenge on all alien kind. What am I supposed to feel here other than shame, obviously? Now there is also the facet of me discussing Duke's character so much because I don't want to talk about this level because it's awful and takes place in either total silence or total Total darkness forcing us into Duke Vision, which is just about the worst way to experience life. After a good long while of running through nearly identical hallways, rolling balls around unlocked doors, and fighting Octo Brains that hurl your rockets back at you, no, it's okay, game. You have your fun. I'll wait my turn. We get to the fight with the alien queen. We're oh, keep it, fucking classy game. Don't censor it for me. What's the point? This fight has one attack that works: just launching pipe bombs at these trampolines, detonating them when they're close to the queen, and then firing rockets. That is all. Just repeat until the boss is dead, which takes a long time given how few rockets you can fire at her before her guard goes back up, how her attack knocks you down, and how there are constantly enemies coming to swarm you. Not to mention sometimes the trampolines just... They don't work. They just don't work. I was never closer to giving up than right here when this pipe bomb misses and just falls harmlessly to the floor. I was so close, but luckily, the time on the board says 420, so we're all good. So Duke dies and we get sent to... Oh, the final boss of me getting this video with a PG rating. We're in a gentleman's club and now have to get some popcorn, a, a prophylactic, and a and a thing we can get a, a 
It's nothing, we get nothing. Man, the floor here looks mighty interesting! This level is just a fetch quest for everything in a small and gross looking club. I don't understand, you get to make a fantasy stri- Gentleman's club and still make it look like garbage! This place is supposed to be a chance to play some of those fun side games and unless those took up a year of development time each, I would rather do anything than play them. Fourteen years! Uh, Bobby! Bobby, come pick me up! I'm scared! I try to drink the pain away to make the censoring job easier, but I have to spend so much time spinning my wheels in the last place I want to be on Earth that it goes away! I am so miserable being here instead of the regular shooting, which I hate too, but I hate this just a little bit more because it means I have to do more work. Erase these boobs on the whiteboard! I draw a very angry-looking Sam the Eagle from the Muppets to show how upset I am. Eventually, we find everything and get into a room alone with the lady. Let me out! I don't wanna be here! Your feminine wiles will work on me, you digital harlot! I know! I'll use Duke Vision to obscure my optics! Suck it, game! I eventually wake up and have a good few levels worth of lore dropped on my head when we learn that the president is using Duke as a scapegoat, saying that we attacked the aliens first and that we're barred from going to Hoover Dam. I'm sorry, game! Was someone rushing you that you just couldn't show any of that and just locked me in a strip club for 20 minutes? I'm not asking for much here, game. Just have a guy hold up a text card that says, and then the president was a bit of a dink, and we'd be keen! The next portion is focused less on running and or gunning, and instead more on plot platforming, jumping from platform to platform, and trying to make the game seem like it has any amount of content to it. Ah, don't worry, Duke, I see right through you. I don't want to be crass here, but it honest to goodness looks like we're walking around on giant turds. The game at least gives us a shot at revenge as we toss frisbees with all the company's logos on them off into the abyss, so thanks for that. Fight some jetpack guys who take an unreasonable amount of bullets to kill and then get right back to the platforming, fucker! And your reward? It's really hard to write jokes when this is what you gotta work with. Like, should I just replay the part from earlier about the turret sections? I don't see why I should try when the game doesn't. Why do these ships blow up at the mere implication of gunfire while these ones seem unkillable? Once you get back to the platforming, it's several hop, skips, and jumps to the Devastator, which holds 69 rockets. You see, it's actually a funny sex number, and if you don't laugh, you're the gay. Sorry, sport. You shoot down a gunship for eight hours and finally get to do something resembling fun when you ride up on an alien corpse with a jetpack to the Duke Burger. Uh, you don't control it, obviously. It's kind of rude to even suggest that you do that, so I'd really appreciate an apology. Oh my god, it's Randy Pitchford! After that is an oh boy, even more Tiny Duke puzzles, my favorite! Holy crap, guys, we're mixing Tiny Duke and Night Vision? This is what we've been waiting for! So Duke scurries around the Duke Burger ceiling before we drop down into the restaurant itself. This is at least a step in the right direction. It at least looks a little different from the other parts of the game. It's not a lot, but I'm really appreciating the work the color red is doing in this scene. What was the point of the aliens shrinking in this part? I'd get it if we weren't already in the throes of an alien invasion, but you already control the building. Why? Is it? Is it a fun? Is it a sex thing? How in... How do... How do you make all of these interactable elements and then not make the action figure one of them? Here, watch. I'll even give you this one for free. It's on me. Looks like I've been playing with myself. That's all yours! So I get to the arcade portion and have to fight off three regular-sized aliens at once while many. The goal is to lure them back to the shrink pads, but it's easier said than done since you have no way of fighting back against these super powerful damaging attacks that can kill you in just a few shots and that you can't run away from since they're so much bigger than you. We jump around a storage closet and come across this lady trapped in the center of a room with an electrified floor. This whole section is just more annoying platforming, except the entire time we have to listen to this lady screaming and talking about how much she wants to board Duke. Always great to see. You fight a few enemies, but otherwise it's just more platforming and more bad jokes. If I was alone in the room and crap, could anyone hear me? Lady, I am platforming on your dead friend. Please treat this with some gravity. We get out of this nightmare and game, if you're gonna make me platform, at least make it quick and painless. After that is even more platforming in the dark, as we get up to the roof and we see that we have to stave off waves of enemies for five minutes until an evac can come and get us. Here we get the Shrink Ray, which is a fun weapon and all, but I'm not exactly eager to use a gimmick weapon in a situation like this, and with the limited ammo and only ten shots, I don't see how it's gonna be any help. Also, where's the music for this entire section? There are just long swabs of gameplay where there's no music. It plays out in total silence. Did Duke go deaf or just lose his Walkman? So we fight off two helicopter guys at once with pretty much no 
know, ammo and eventually gets saved and whisked off to somewhere marginally more interesting. The middle of nowhere. Not before another turret section. These shirts would be a lot more awkward if there weren't so many of them. I want you all to know that I was so sure we were almost done with the game that I cheated and checked how many levels were left and my heart sank. F***ing sank when I saw we're only halfway done. I hate it here. You're gonna have to excuse me if the next few levels aren't covered in sterling detail here. If you ever get bored with what I'm talking about, look at this cool gif I found on the internet. If that doesn't work, I'll try jingling my keys next. So we eventually touch down and get Duke's iconic monster truck that's been in every game previously. When I think about all the unnecessary stuff this game adds that no Duke game ever needed, cars are pretty much at the top of the list. The driving controls suck and that godforsaken temperature bar is back. The path forward is vaguely suggested by some terrain and tire tracks, but you'd be shocked how easy it is to get turned around and totally lose the run of this level. If you ever get stuck, don't worry, Duke uses his patented telekinesis to flip it right side up again. The level starts to pick up when you get onto a highway and have to start plowing through barricades, but in a move of, of pure malice, just, just watch. These dirt bags actually have the gall to make you run out of gas. You remember that scene in Commando where Arnie says, Drat, it appears we've run out of gas. It's time to walk forward in a civil and respectful manner. No, he'd punch the engine until it worked again. But no, Duke has to walk a mile there and a mile back to get a gas can that takes us a whole two yards because we drive a monster truck. I wasn't kidding about walking either, though. You just have to drag yourself back to the truck with no enemies, no music, just wasting time. We aren't even back in the car for five minutes before we run out of gas again and have to go to an old Old West ghost town to pick up some more. This part actually does line up with what was in the original 2001 build, what with the Old Western parts. You ever get the feeling that if you suggested anything during DNF's development it would get put in? Like, the cutting room floor of this game was squeaky clean. The ghost town is nothing special, it's just more shooting, except instead of gray we're up against the color brown. Shoot some guys, shoot bigger guys, and then we do some stupid platforming to get the gas and we drive through the barn. If you're worried I'm skipping anything and like, why would you be? But don't worry, I'm actually embellishing the details. After we get out of town, we're stuck in a cave and have to drive out to, guess what? More desert. The most pulse-pounding thing to happen in this level is when I got my car so stuck that I had to restart the whole level. Aren't I lucky? You're supposed to ram your truck into the support, but my eyes were just glazed over from disinterest that I totally ignored it for a long time. You get back on the road and have to drive past these trucks with pigs tossing barrels off before the road gets blown up and it begins to feel like the game is skipping a little bit. We've been on the highway, had it blown up, and then driven across a canyon three times now. This is 14 years worth of ideas. Also, either every alien is a dead shot at aiming or Duke has hooked up his vitals to his car's engine because he feels all the damage the car does, which gets you killed by bumping into a rock. If anybody had running out of gas for a third time, on their Duke Nukem Bingo cards, make sure to put a chip down. This next part is one of the most frustrating sections in the whole game. You have to run through an alien war zone where you have to stay huddled up behind waist-high cover to let your health refill as aliens land every shot possible on you from any range. They cover every angle you have and will bum rush you when you're especially low on health. What am I supposed to do? I barely do enough damage to fight off a normal amount and now I'm dealing with twice that in terrain that they always have the advantage in. Not just because they're in better positions, but they also blend in with everything. Look, this guy is on the other side of a canyon with a pistol and lands every shot on me. Ref, there's gotta be some foul play. They don't even stop shooting you when they're being shot, and when the gun is pointing away from you, the bullets still hit you. How is this supposed to be a power fantasy when Duke is left shivering and afraid behind rickety wooden doors, literally waiting until he feels better about himself? I had to replay this section so many times because the amount of enemies is just ridiculous for the lack of health you have. And I have been looking at every nudie mag I can, so there's nothing else I could have done. You can execute enemies for all your health back like Doom's glory kills, but whereas those are always available if you deal enough damage, a Duke Nukem Forever's are just at total random, so there's no way to account for them in your assault. And then there's another turret section! Three more and I get a free Sunday. After that, you have to take on a gunship with a missile attack that can kill you in one shot, which it did to me twice. It even blows up the turret, so there goes any chance of you making things go quickly. Look what happens when you shoot homing rockets at it. Homing in on what, rogue ghosts? A crowbar would come in handy right about now. Thank you, Duke, always keeping morale up. 
We run through a cave and get the gas before riding back in a minecart, or rather pushing the minecart most of the way, and then getting a scripted ride where we can't really do anything all the way back to the car. We fuel up and finally get back on the road to Hoover Dam. Give the game this, it's certainly one of the top 10 games I've played this year where it culminates in going to Hoover Dam. It's not a close second, but the competition is stiff. One final car crash for the road and we meet back up with the president who chews us out for starting stuff with the aliens. One thing is clear, he was obviously elected on his strength of character. Literally, this character is invincible. We meet back up with Captain Dylan, and it's funny, I'd always wanted to... Uh, take a binge drinking. After a brief enemy wave is another battle lord, and with only a few ammo crates, uh, the two explosive weapons in the game not being very good, in a much worse arena, and with more enemies, it's certainly on the lower end of fights with battle lords in the game. We ram a spike into its eye, and the game decides that now it's gonna try, since it gets back up to keep fighting. You can imagine that throwing in a new phase out of nowhere could be a bit of a curveball, but it's not. It mostly just sucks. It takes so many tries to kill him, especially when phase two adds a grenade launcher. You just don't have the room to breathe in what is essentially a hallway, and with the other enemies attacking alongside him, there's just too much to manage for how awful Duke feels to control in this. Also, look at this. Guns pointed up, bullets shoot down. This is what the Kennedy Report was talking about. We kill it and look for any way forward that doesn't involve talking to Dylan. Holy f Duke. This is just like that one time in Beirut. You wouldn't believe the chubby I got. I got orders to hold this f***ing shit together up here, but Graves wants you at the base of the dam. Drop the f***ing GR-44 rope for you to rappel down. Just don't get rope burned this time. None of those massage specials around right now, huh? Huh? Jerk it off! <laughs> All right, game, I'll make you a trade. Kill Dylan, I'll give you a 6 out of 10, okay? So we go further into the dam, and if you can guess it, the game has finally settled on a color palette of bad. This part of development was clearly done in the short time frame where we didn't think Doom 3 was the worst one. We get a freeze ray, which is a gimmick weapon, but with functionalities. It sets enemies up for executions. We fight off more enemies, most of whom are fighting from up on catwalks we can't get to, and we move to a room filled with valves and steam and more puzzle and fun. You know, game, you can't actually have Duke say... Right. I hate valve puzzles. And then have him do the valve puzzle. It ruins the joke. Have him say that and then throw a beer can at something until the door opens. Don't actually have him do the puzzle. It's just more bland fighting until I have had it up to here with you, game. Mike and the rat's strafe. We unscrew some bolts and go into the air vents because George Broussard has a sick obsession with a tiny Duke Nukem. We do more platforming around fans, electrical outlets, and gears until the game decides to try again. I never said hard. Start of the next level and we're still tiny until we finally grow back to size. They thought this is what people wanted. No, we're staying here. They didn't just have it rise up quickly. This is their fault. I'll start being fair when they start being good. We eventually get to the next turret section. Come on, come on. Which also leads us to a boss fight with the Octo King. He throws two shipping crates and then runs away. I hope you can hear how on the edge of my seat I am! After that, the game finally gives long-term Duke fans exactly what they wanted. A forklift. A slow, ineffective, unwieldy forklift. I have a theory that there was a prankster loose in the 3D Realms office who had everybody convinced that every day was opposite day and that instead of having good ideas, they should have bad ones. And they probably started feeling bad sometime around year eight, but by that point, the con had been running for too long and they just had to roll with it. After that is a stupid long battle arena that takes place in total darkness unless you use Duke Vision, but I'd rather use hard drugs than Duke Vision. My one mercy to you today is that I'm skipping most of this segment. We get to meet up with crusty old dude and have to ride along with him in an on rail section, which is probably the one thing this game was missing. The entire time you ride to your destination, you have to listen to crusty old dude talking your ear off. Have I mentioned how I can't stand when anybody in this game opens their mouths? Trust me, they weren't saving the good writing for the other characters. We fight the Octo King again, and he has the interesting quirk of having a flat-out unavoidable attack, except when it just stops and decides to not hit you. Thankfully, skill is not needed to win this game, as they give you a little panic room to hide in where you can't be hurt and nothing kills you, and dreams come true. After you kill the Octo King, he tries to drag you into his mouth, and you have to blast the heck out of him before he kills you. It's actually a thrilling section, which I assume is going to be followed up with at least a 20-minute uh, turret section. Just watch. Oh, thank God, crusty old dude is still alive! One second before the next level, I need to take a leak. Alright, team, let's go for it. The further we get into the dam, the more the game just 
starts to confuse me. Okay, so I'm in a weird place. Duke Nukem Forever is one of the most famous video games ever made, for better and definitely for worse. That being said, I feel like the myth of Duke Nukem Forever is way more impactful than the game itself. Like, everybody knows about the game, but I feel like nobody actually talks about the game that Duke Nukem Forever is. The game that actually came out of Duke Nukem Forever's 14-year development cycle is honestly one of the least interesting things about the story, and as a result, it just sort of exists as this somehow infamous and obscure game at the same time. I know this is sounding like a ramble, but there is a point, and it's this. Despite this being, like I said, one of the most famous games ever made, talked about hundreds of times by over thousands of people, and picked apart for every one of its horrible little flaws, how did nobody tell me there was a water level? Not just a water level, multiple water levels. Not sections where you swim, I mean levels taking place exclusively underwater. We swim through the rest of the level all the way to a dying Captain Dylan. All right, game, maybe you and I aren't so different. I run away as he gives his dying words and feel a lot better now that I know he isn't in the game anymore. He comes back in the DLC? You trying to start something, game? We get back on our way and find ourselves in the totally underwater level I was talking about. I just stick your lips to an air pipe and get air back, all while floating slowly through water against Octo Brains, which as Octopi have a distinct advantage against us, a Duke Nukem. For anybody in the audience worried that this game was getting fun, I'm here to tell you that we're under no threat of that. After that is a fight with a big leech. It's got one attack falling on us, and I'd say I was bored, but my body could still feel sensations like boredom. Uh, we're just at uncomfortably numb. We're back on dry land and I decide to use my fighting style and just run around with a barrel and hope nothing barrel proof tries to find me. Oh, I was expecting a monkey. Listen here, you scumbag. Nobody makes fun of Donkey Kong except me. You got that? From there, we get blasted out of the dam and have to listen to the president talk about how he's going to nuke us before we're getting squashed by the cycloid emperor. You'd think this would mean he's on our side, but nope, he insists on violence. The final boss of the game is here, and I kid you not, not one word of exaggeration, this is the exact same fight from the beginning of the game. There is not one new attack, one new move, not even a new name. You just repeat the fight, except you have to do it three times because nothing is more climactic than killing a boss in the exact same way three times. You get the Devastator in the final phase like that means anything. I decide to kill him in Duke Vision out of protest and get to see the exact same animation from the beginning of the game, save for pissing in his eye at the end. But when I tell you that's it, that's it. You jump in a helicopter, get nuked, cut to black, we get a shot of a screen saying Duke's dead, Duke says Duke isn't dead, Duke becomes the 69th president of the United States of America. After you beat the game, you actually unlock extras like trailers for the game's various builds, like the 1988 E3 build, which was apparently made for viewing on postage stamps. The fact they even included a roadmap for how long it took meant they weren't totally embarrassed, which is odd if you ask me. So that's Duke Nukem Forever. Long and short of it is that this game was doomed from year seven of development onward. There are no games in the world that can live up to the hype when the years of development reach the double digits. If Team Eco can't manage it, I don't think 3D Realms has a chance. They could have put out the best game ever made and people would still be asking for more. Problem is that we didn't get the best game ever made. We got Duke Nukem Forever. I'd love to say that Duke Nukem Forever is one of those games that if you removed it from the hype surrounding it, that it was actually worth playing, but removing this game from its legacy is like removing the color green from grass. It's a bad game. A really, really bad game, but not because it's incompetent, but because it's so boring. I'm done with the game and I'm still wondering when it starts. I think that beyond the troubled development cycle, this game's identity crisis is its biggest problem. You can see every shooter that this game tries to emulate, and you can see even clearer how it fails at everything it tries. Instead of making another Duke game, they made a horrible chimera of shooters from 1998 to 2011, taking everything and refining none of it. It's a jack of all trades, master of none. It tries so hard that it forgets what being a Duke Nukem game is. Duke doesn't need cars or swimming or a joke every 10 feet. It needs to be fast and fun. Everything else just complicates the formula. Imagine if Doom 2016 had a turret section, let alone 18. In losing Duke's spirit, it lost any charm the old games might have had and replaced it with some of the worst writing in a major release you'll ever see. You don't need Shakespeare. You just need someone who can write funny jokes. The funniest thing in the game is the Duke soundboard. Oh yeah, oh yeah, my, my, suck, suck, my balls, my my balls, my balls, my balls, my balls, my balls, my balls. Ah, crap, I did a theme month by accident.